you so much. <laughs> okay, well, it's my lot to uh, present history to you today, and uh, history can't be work very boring. Um, I hope you're not going to get bored. I don't want to see any of you looking at your watches, you know, so I'm going to watch the clock. Um, at school, history was not one of my best subjects. In fact, it was way down the list. Um, on the top was uh, mathematics. I used to love maths. And um, English came next. So I tend to think in straight lines. There's nothing artistic about me. Um, in fact, art was at the bottom of the list when it came to this. It really was. I, I'm still absolutely awful at art. And, um, as I said, there's nothing artistic about me. If you look at my website, you'll see what, you'll, you'll see that reflected in the website, and you'll probably see it on these slides as well. So I haven't got any uh, um, all this clever stuff like um, Gary Gary had this morning. Um, <laughs> it's plain and straightforward. Um, most of it is quotations. Right? Most of it is quotations because. What I want to bring to you is not what I think, what I feel, what I believe. What I want to show you is what is actually in the history books, what you can find in the history books when you dig into them. All right? Now, I believe history, I've come to the place in my life where I believe history is extremely important, mm -hmm. especially for us today. Uh, what was Ellen White said about our history? We had nothing. To fear for the future, except what? We forget the way that God has led us and our teachings in our past history. You know? I've come to the place, let me go on to the first slide. I've come to the place where I believe that the Seventh day Adventists have become very confused over their own history. I think Benjamin Wilkinson pointed out something very, very important because he said, the present can never be properly understood without correct information concerning the past. He said this, those who have been taught a falsified history or who have had their minds filled with twisted interpretations of events gone by, they stagger like the blind with a darkened mind. And I'm sorry to say it today, there are many amongst us who are like that. They don't know their history and they're being confused, well they are confused, and they're being led astray because of that. And I've seen some things lately um, in our own publications that I know are not true. Historically, not true. Now I've looked at it and said, that's not true, but I wonder how many others can do the same? I would say that you have probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of people looking at those articles and believing them to be true, simply because they don't know our history. He went on to say on the next page, it is equally true that a person who has distorted views of the present, obviously because they've had distorted views of the past, they cannot build for a better future. And we want a better future. And our only hope, reasoning this way, and I believe Benjamin Wilkinson is correct, our only hope to build that better future is if we have a correct knowledge of the past. It's like a builder, isn't it? You know someone coming to build a house? If he has 40 foundations, well, the house might stand there for a little while, but it will soon, soon begin to tip one way or sink one way. The foundations have to be good. And if we want a better future, we need a good foundation. So I'm saying this afternoon that we need to understand the truth about the history of the Trinity Doctrine. How it became a part of the teachings of early Christianity, how it became part of the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I believe that without this knowledge, we cannot build for a better future. In history, you'll find there are two basic versions of the Trinity Doctrine. There may be other variations, but there's two basic versions. The first is the Orthodox Trinity Doctrine. That's the one that you know has been handed down through uh, the centuries. 
uh, Eastern Orthodox Church holds it, Roman Catholic Anglicans, Lutherans, and, and so on and so on. Right now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want to upset anybody today, all right? And I haven't come to the wrong meeting, I can assure you. <laughs> but I have certain sympathies with the Orthodox Trinity doctrine. Certain sympathies, all right? But with this one, I'm sorry, I have no sympathies. The first one, I can see some justification from Scripture for having this teaching. Some justification. Right? But the bottom one, the version that is held by our church, I cannot see any justification at all from Scripture for holding them. So let's have a look for a moment at the Orthodox Trinity Doctrine. What we'll do, we'll look at the Athanasian Creed. All right? Athanasius, he, he didn't compile his creed, he was dead by the time it came along, but I'm pretty sure that someone gave it that name probably in honour of the work he did in, in getting this out in the format he did. If you look through the history books, Athanasius worked hard, really hard, uh, in all fairness to him, to, to get to the place where the church accepted this creed. Right? And this is what the creed says. It's, it's held by the Roman Catholic Church. They don't use it very much now, but it's still the centrality of their beliefs. It says this, Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. Now, that's strong words. Now, what it's saying is, if you don't believe what's in this document, you're lost. Right? Now, I have something to say about that, because I don't believe there is any salvation in believing something simply because a church teaches it. And I don't care if it's a Catholic Church, Baptist, Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist Church. There is no salvation in, in, you know this as well as I do, but perhaps people who are, you know, will be watching this video, etc., in, in time, you know, next week's months, they probably won't realize it. But there is no salvation in believing something just because a church teaches it. And there is no salvation either in believing certain doctrines. Now, some people get this idea that they get this list of doctrines, maybe that the church teaches, you know, and they check all the right boxes, you know, and say, hey, great, I've got them all right, I'm saved. <laughs> Nonsense. Salvation is not like that. Right? You won't be saved by believing something that church teaches, and you won't be saved because you tick all the right boxes. You can only be saved without a saving relationship through a saving. There is no other way a daily walk with him. This is how it goes on. And let me say this as well. I said there's no salvation in just believing doctrines or a certain doctrine. And this is more so the Trinity doctrine. Because the Trinity doctrine, at the end of the day, at its very best, is only an assumed doctrine. That's all it is. You won't find it in the scriptures. It's man-made. It's assumed. And I've never yet met one scholar, or read one scholar, shall we say, worth his salt, who hasn't admitted that. Every scholar I've read, who, you know, a good scholar, will always say, it's not in the scriptures, but you'll find enough evidence in there to come to the conclusion that God is a trinity. But it's still an assumed doctrine. And this is what it says. The Catholic faith, of the faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. Now that's the basis, the basic premise of any Trinity doctrine. There are two factors in there, threeness and oneness. Now the threeness is obvious, because if you haven't got three, you haven't got the tri, you have tri unity. Right? So it's the threeness and the oneness, and sometimes I speak to people about Trinity Doctrine, the same as you do, and they have all sorts of different beliefs what Trinity Doctrine is, or what it means when God is a Trinity, or when we say God is a Trinity. But that's the basic premise. There are three persons. Most Trinitarians don't really like using the word persons, but they say it's the nearest we have in the English language. 
So they three, say three persons in one indivisible substance. And it's that one indivisible, indivisible substance that, that constitutes in the Trinitarian model the one God. This is how it goes on. The Father is made of none. Uh, this is one of the reasons, by the way, I say I have great sympathies with the Trinity Doctrine. One of the reasons, right? Because this is what I believe. Now you have to look at it. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made, not created, but begotten. There is a difference between the two, one begotten, one unbegotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Now this is the Western uh, idea of the Trinity, the one held by the Roman Catholic Church, because when uh, the Creed first uh, came out of Constantinople, it said that the Holy Ghost is of the Father. It didn't say, and the Son. But the, and the Son was added by the Western uh, Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. And even today, that, that what seemingly little innocent thing, it helps to split the Eastern and, and, and Western churches, and they don't come together uh, because of it. But that's, that's my belief. That's my belief. The Father uh, is made of none. He's not begotten. The Son is begotten. Holy Spirit proceeding. This is the Westminster Confession of Faith. In the unity of the Godhead, there will be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. That's just the word in. Have you read that in Scripture? No, it's not there. That's because, you see, the Trinitarians say, one God. Therefore, the three persons in there are the same God, in that sense, if you see what I mean. So you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Ghost. The Father is, is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten with the Father. And the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. And any a little bit of additional information. Eternally begotten. This is where you have the co-eternity of the Son, the co-eternity of the Holy Spirit. All three, all the whole one God has always been there. And so, the, whole, the, the, the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. That might seem a contradiction. We'll go back to that again. Right? The, Holy, uh, the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding. So, in the Trinity Doctrine, we have all three have always been what they are today, all three will be what they always have been, all three together constitute the one God, and the one triune God can never, ever undergo change. Now, it's a little bit of a contradiction, isn't it, with what the scriptures say, as we, we heard from Gary this morning. It says, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by him. And what the scriptures reveal, I believe, is a divine order. The Father is the source of the personality of the Son. The Father works through the Son. The Son never works through the Father. It's always the Father coming through the Son. Never, ever the other way around. Now let me give you my understanding of the God. Uh, it's, it's important in, in one sense uh, to do with this presentation today. Uh, but I would also like to share it with you, what I believe about God. And it's only a brief excursion, all right? A very brief one. John 1, 1, we all know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I believe that, that Christ is, is God himself in the person of the Son. He's not another God. He's God himself in the person of the Son. The New English Bible puts it this way, and I think this is the closest it comes to the King James out of all the other versions. Some versions say, uh, and the word was divine, or the word was a divine being, or something like that. 
And I don't think that's anywhere near close to what John was actually saying. I think what John was meant to say was that the Word was God. It's as simple as that. Not just simply that he was divine, but he was God. And what God was, the Word was. An English teacher might say, well, that's not very good grammar. But I think it's, it's close enough to convey what John was saying. Right? Whatever, uh, whatever God is, so is the Word, so is the Son. Colossians 2 and 9 says, For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is not a partial indwelling of divinity. It is divinity dwelling wholly in Christ. Uh, I have certain um, discussions with other people that, that believe, and I won't go into them today, that believe that in Christ, he, when he came, he was not fully or totally divine. The divinity was lacking a little bit in certain departments. Now, I'm sorry, I can't accept that one. I believe that in Christ was all the fullness of the Godhead. Then, of course, we come to the divine mis mystery. You know what that is, don't you? Huh? The Holy Spirit. Jesus, in his last discourse, a major discourse with his disciples, he spoke about the coming of the Comforter. And this is what he said. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. Who's coming? I will come to you. And a few seconds later he said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and have our abode with him. So I believe that the Father, or the Holy Spirit rather, is the Father and the Son omnipresent. Whilst they are physically in heaven, bodily in heaven. I believe they do exist physically. Not every denomination will teach that. Some will say that God doesn't have body and parts. I don't believe that. I could go into a long thing about that today. Uh, but maybe, maybe it's because of this Trinity belief that this belief went out the window. Because you try to imagine the Trinity God and you try to imagine Him as a physical person. I find it very, very difficult. So I believe that the Holy Spirit is the omnipresence of the Father and the Son. Getting back to the Trinity doctrine. The Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, they are the divine oneness. They are three persons in triunity, one God. So how did the doctrine come to be formulated? Right. Uh, I don't think anybody can start talking about the formulation of the Trinity doctrine without getting to areas. Right? Because I... It, it's more than like, I suppose somebody would have come along if it hadn't been Arius, it had been somebody else. But Arius was condemned as a heretic. In fact, nearly all the Christian books that I've ever read have, have put Arius at the top of the heretic list. You know? Um, me? Well, I believe he's probably the most maligned person in Christian history. All right? And I'm not just being awkward, I'm not just being rebellious against Christianity, it really is my honest belief. The problem with Arius was his writings were destroyed. I'm not 100% sure of all the detailed beliefs you know, behind what he believed. I think we can get it basically from what he, from what he said, but all the details behind it, and I think because of this, Arius has been uh, said to believe certain things that I think if he was here today, he would say, no way, Jose, I didn't believe anything like it. You know, it's a question of, uh, what's that game children play? Chinese whispers? Mm -hmm. You know, I'll come back to that uh, later on. Arius, he was a Libyan, born around 256, some say 250, uh, we won't argue over it. Died in 336, which made him about 80, 80 ish when he died. He was a presbyter in Alexandria. Right? You know that that was a seat of learning out there. But, and this is very important, he was a student of Lucian of Antioch. What was Antioch? Where? Christian. Christian? What was it? 
was called Christians. They were first called Christians, the seed of Christianity, if you like. Now, what I have here is, is a list I've made of um, views of areas that I've found through people's writings, right, uh, in the main, were in opposition to areas. Not his friends, let's just say his enemies. Right? And this is what they said of Arius. He was an intellectual, capable of very intellectual and intelligent reasoning. He was a tall, lean man of distinguished appearance, maybe like Gary over there. Impeccable man, brilliant preacher. His preaching grew big crowds. He was a brilliant student of the scriptures. He was renowned for his knowledge of the scriptures and his beliefs. Well, countless numbers of followers. And including in that, as we shall see in a minute, there were top ranking bishops and presbyters. Now that is not altogether a picture I see of areas at times in certain books. Sometimes it seems as though he's out on his own, out and in with just one or two people following. Don't believe it. Arius had a big following. And what we see in this dispute is Antioch versus Alexandria. Two different, very, two very different schools of thought. Antiochian school of thinking was literal, which Adrian, I think, I don't know if Gary mentioned that this morning, I know Adrian did. Uh, the Alexandrian school of thinking was very much allegorical. Right? And because of that, the Antiochian school of thinking accented on the human Christ. Whereas the, the Alexandrian school, they tended to accent on his divinity. And so you had this clash, not just in thinking, but in what they viewed, what they concentrated their efforts on. All right? So what we have in this Trinity dispute is Antioch versus Alexandria. So what began? Well, the original dispute was between the beliefs of Arius and his followers and the beliefs of Alexander, all right, uh, the Bishop of Alexandria. Now, I'm going to give you a few quotes now. I don't want to get bored because I, you know, just have a look at them, see what they're really saying, because I believe they're really, really, really interesting and in, 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 is what's said. Now, this is what uh, Sosomon said. Although we have shown religion was in a flourishing condition at this period, early 4th century, Yet the churches were disturbed by sore contentions, for under the pretext of piety and of seeking the more perfect discovery of God, certain questions were agitated which had not until then been examined. Now remember those words, all right? They had not yet, uh, up until that time, been examined. It says Arius was the originator of these disputations. Uh, there was a little dispute uh, in, uh, that, that Solomon spoke about in, in, in his writing, nothing to do with the Godhead. And what he says is this, afterwards, after the dispute, Alexander also, and he's the Bishop of Alexandria, remember, Alexander also held him, Arius, in high repute, since he, Arius, was a most expert logician, for it was said that he was not lacking in such, in such knowledge. So you see, Arius, even by Alexander, was held in very, very high uh, repute. Then he goes on to say, he, Arius, fell into absurd discourses, so that he had the audacity to preach in the church that no one else that never before him had ever suggested. Remember, it was said, these were questions that were not had been examined before. Namely, that the Son of God was made out of that which had no prior existence, that there was a period of time in which he existed not, that as possessing free will, he was capable of, capable of vice and virtue, and that he was created and made. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, all right? But we'll see as we go along that Arius was not so out on a limb, he was not such a heretic as many people uh, believe him to be today. Right. 
Those who heard these doctrines advance blamed Alexander for not opposing the ambitions it bearings with doctrine, but this bishop deemed it more advisable to leave each party to the free discussion of <coughs> doubtful topics. Things that hadn't been discussed, things that hadn't been examined, that no one, you know, that hadn't sat round the table and sorted it out. So that by persuasion, and this was good in it, uh, on Alexander's part uh, in one sense, so that by persuasion, rather than by force, they might cease from contention. In other words, let them sit down and, and discuss it. Let's see what comes out of it. All right? This is what happened. And he sat down as a judge, Alexander, with some of his clergy and led both sides into a discussion. But it happened on this occasion, and it is generally the case in a strife of words, that each party claimed a victory. Arius defended his assertions, but the others contended that the Son is consubstantial and co-eternal with the Father. So what was the issue? What was the debate between the two? One was saying, no, he is not consubstantial and co-eternal, and the other one saying, yes, he is consubstantial and co-eternal. And that was what the argument was all about. Now then, it goes on. The council was convened a second time, and the same points contested, but they came to no agreement amongst themselves. And during the debate, Alexander seemed to incline first to one party, and then over to the other. He swayed between the two each time, you know? Perhaps one would say something, he'd say, oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. The others would say something, yeah, that's a good point. And he'd come over to this side. And that's how he went on. Remember, he was the Bishop of Alexandria. Right? Now, there's a question. We know what Alexander believed. He believed that Christ was God himself. In fact, he, he ended up, as we all know on the belief, that he was consubstantial. Right? Here's a question. Why did Alexander, if Arius did believe that Christ was created like an angel, which many people say today that that's what Arius believed, I've read too many books to know any differently, right? why did Alexander sway towards one belief one time and then sway towards another belief at one another time? Think about something for a moment. I believe that An An Arius did not believe that Christ was created. He did not believe. If he was here today, he would totally deny that. Right? Now, I want you to imagine for a moment a discussion between a group of Jehovah's Witnesses. You know what Jehovah's Witnesses believe? That Christ was a created being. A special being, the first one, highly exalted, nevertheless, created. Right? Now, I want you to imagine a, a, a discussion between Jehovah's Witnesses and a group who believe the same as myself. Right? Now, you know what I believe because I told you just now. All right? Now then, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christ is the first of God's creation. Me, I believe that Christ is God himself in the person of the Son. There is no compatibility between those two beliefs. Now, can you imagine me inclining towards the Jehovah's Witness who believe that, that Christ was a created being. There is absolutely no way I would do it. And neither did Alexander. Because Arius did not believe that Christ was a created being. It's absolute proof. All right? Arius, what Arius could not accept was that Christ was a part of God. That's saying something different. That's what Arius could not accept. And he had reasons. We'll come back to those reasons in a minute. The council was convened the second time. All right, he said he had climbed the first one part of the other. Finally, however, he declared himself in favour of those who affirmed that the Son was consubstantial and co-eternal with the Father. And he commanded Arius to receive this doctrine and to reject his former position. So it was a command to do it. The YAT Jones said in the two republics, there was no dispute about the fact of there being a trinity. It was about the nature of the trinity 
Both parties believe in precisely the same trinity, but they differ upon the precise relationship which the Son bears to the Father. And that was the issue. Not whether Christ was God. Arius fully believed that. He had no problems in that. The problem was, was he consubstantial with the Father? Was he a part of God? Arius, and good for him I say, Arius, however, would not be persuaded to compliance. But look what it says next. Many of the bishops and the clergy considered his statement of doctrine to be correct. You don't hear that very often, do you? Because what you hear mostly, oh, they all rejected Arius, throw it out. No, 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 no. That is not the record of history. Many of the bishops and the clergy, as the higher ups, and you know, the alien heavens of this world, right? The clergy. Alexander, therefore, what changes? Ejected him and the clergy who concurred with him in sentiment from the church. They rejected him from the church. They even list some of the names of the well known names. This is another area in there somewhere, I think. Those of the parish of Alexandria who had embraced his opinions were the presbyters, atheists, Achilles, Carpolis, Samartes, Arius, Deacons, whatever. They were well enough to be named. So these were well-known people, and Alexander ejected him and all the rest. All right? Now look what it says. Many of the people likewise, our slave people, many of the people likewise sided with them, because they imagined their doctrines to be of God. Others, as frequently happens in similar cases, because they believe them to be to have been ill-treated and unjustly communicate, communicated. All right. The questions, Sosmos goes on to say, the questions they had started became matters of debate amongst the bishops. So Arius had set people talking about matters that up to that time had not been discussed. Right. Now, I find this very interesting, and I'm sure you will. I have a book home by Reverend Ole Steele, they're obviously Trinitarians, and Reverend Campbell, right? The story of the church. This is what it says about the 4th century. Of its many great preachers, how often do you hear areas called a great preacher? Of its many great preachers, none was more striking than Arius, a tall man with a stoop, with wild blazing eyes, and with a capacity for a terrific outburst. No man could sway the hearts of his hearers as he did. Wow! Do you like that that he said of you, Adrian? Yeah? <laughs> No man could sway the hearts of his hearers as did Arius. He was eloquent, he was learned, and he was sincere. But, here comes the but, there's always a but. You know. But the doctrine which he preached cut at the very roots of the gospel. Wow, poor old Arius. So intellectual, so clever, so learned, so highly regarded, and he, they, just before all this happened, they, they made him the presbyter of, of, of the, one of the oldest churches in Alexandria, Balkus, I think it was called, and it was set right in the heart where there were so many people that he could influence. What a mistake. And what was his crime? What do you think his crime was? Arius said that God the Father and God the Son were separate peace. Well, well, well. What a mistake to me. How did you arrive at all those conclusions this morning, Gary? Eh? And why didn't you say to me about God the Father and God the Son? Why didn't you find those scriptures that spoke about God the Father and God the Son? You have a list of all the other ones. Why not that one? Because you know, don't you? Don't you? It's not there, is it? No. 
This is the Trinitarian speed again. And that was Ares' crime. God the Father and God the Son were separate beings. I'm closing now with, with something from two letters from Theodora's history. All right. And what we see there is a comparison of beliefs. The two letters, one by Alexander and one by Ares. All right. This is Alexander. We have learnt that the Son is immutable and unchangeable, all-sufficient and perfect, like his Father, lacking only in his unbegotten. That's what we would say, wouldn't it? Yeah? Yeah. He is the exact and precisely similar image of his Father. For it is clear that the image fully contains everything by which the greater likeness exists. As the Lord taught us when he said, My Father is greater than I. So what we can see here is an equality. Right? But one unbegotten, one begotten. The begotten, the exact and precise likeness of the one who is unbegotten. Right? He goes on. And according, according to this, we believe that the Son always existed of the Father. Now we have the co-eternity of the Son coming in again. Always existed of the Father, for he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his Father's person. Obviously quoting Hebrews 1, 3. He then said this, But let no one be led by the word always, to imagine that the Son is unbegotten. It's a bit of an awkward thing to imagine, isn't it, really? Because Adrian has a son. He begot a son. Right? But can you imagine that saying Adrian has eternally begotten that son? It, it doesn't really sit right, does it? Yeah? And this is what Alexander realised. Because if you say someone has always been there, how can you say he's been begotten? And this is what Alexander was saying, you see. But let no one be led by the word always to imagine that the Son is unbegotten, as is thought by some who have their intellect, intellect blinded. Some persons have said mentally deficient. For to say that he was, that he has always been, and that before ages, is not to say that he is unbegotten. So Alexander is saying just because he has always been there doesn't mean he is not begotten. So that's where he had the Trinity doctrine, that uh, he has always been God, be begotten. Now, in comparison, letter of areas to... Uh, Eusebius of Nicodemia, one of his friends, close friends. He, Alexander, has driven us out of the city as atheists because we do not concur in what he publicly preaches. Namely, God always, the Son always, as the Father, so the Son, the Son coexists, unbegotten with God, he is everlasting, neither by thought nor by any interval does God precede the Son, always God, always Son, is begotten of the unbegotten, the Son is God himself. He then goes on to say, but we say and believe and have taught and do teach that the Son is not unbegotten, nor in any way part of the unbegotten, and that he does not derive the subsistence from any matter, but, now you listen to these words carefully, you don't hear these quoted very often. But that by his own will and counsel, he has subsisted before time and before ages as perfect God, only begotten and unchangeable. And that before he was begotten or created or purposed or established, he was not, for he was not unbegotten. In other words, he came out of the Father in eternity as a personality. And yet, he is God himself, unchangeable in his pre-existence. 
Yet we read just now that one of the accusations against Arius was that Christ was, 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 could change. He could either remain sinless, or as we would say today, he could sin. And that is one of the things they had against Arius. And this is what blew the whole thing up, I believe. The Arius came out with this belief that hadn't been examined before. Because Arius, in his Antiochian thinking, he looks at the incarnate Christ, he reads Hebrews 2, Hebrews 4, he says he was made like us into all things, that he was subject to, you know, to everything, that, that our limitations, our liabilities. He saw him walk in the earth as, as a man. He saw that he could have forfeited his existence. I believe that was what was in Arius' his mind. And these people were saying, no, 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 no. No. He can't change. He cannot change. And this is why I believe that this doctrine developed. It was to, to put down this, this belief that when Christ came, he was subject to all the liabilities and limitations that we have. Socrates. Socrates. Someone accordingly asked them, the followers of Arius, whether the word of God could be changed as the devil had been. And they feared not to say, yes he could, for being begotten, he is susceptible of change. We then, with the bishops of Egypt and Libya, being assembled together to the number of nearly a hundred, have anathematized Arius for his shameless avowal of these heresies, together with all such have encountered them, uh, countenanced them. And that is why they objected to Arius, I believe, because he saw Christ coming to the earth as God, uh, as a human being, and he saw him subject to everything that you and I are subject to. Going back to what A.T. Jen said, no dispute about the fact there being a Trinity. It was about the nature of the Trinity. And that is the important thing, I believe, that we have to remember. Arius was not disputing, this was not a dispute over whether Christ was God. People today, the Trinitarians, they want to make it look like that. But a history book says, no, that was not so. And that's why I'm saying to you, I believe Arius it was the most malign person in the history of Christianity. And I'm looking forward, I said to someone this morning, I'm looking forward to meeting Arius in the kingdom. I really am. Because I should shake his hand and I should say, well done. Well done for standing by your beliefs, no matter what they threw at you. You know what happened to Arius, don't you? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, the, in the next one. All right? It's to be continued. Mm -hmm. <laughs>